Shalom and uh, welcome to today's Middle East Report. In this program today, we have a very special guest all the way from the United States who's going to tell us about the importance of standing with Israel and the Jewish people in these end times. A warm welcome to the program. And today we have a very special guest all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, that's Rabbi Jonathan Burnus, the president and CEO of uh, Jewish Voice. Well, what a pleasure it is to have you on the Middle East Report, uh, Jonathan. Simon, it's a pleasure for me, and, and I just want to begin by thanking you and Howard and everyone at Revelation TV for standing with Israel and the Jewish people. It means so much to me as a Jewish believer. Thank so you. keep up the good work. Thank you, and, and you as well. I mean, so many of our viewers uh, tune in and watch, uh, watch Jewish Voice in your programs as well, and uh, the way that you educate the church around the world about the importance of uh, Israel and the importance of the Jewish people is excellent, so thank you. Thank you. you. But can we start where, um, where your journey began? Um, how did, you, you obviously grew up in a, a Jewish background. Uh, how did you come to faith in Yeshua HaMashiach? Oh my, uh, 38 years ago. I was studying in university. I had one goal, Simon, and that was to be a successful, wealthy businessman. I was, had just completed my second year in the School of Business Administration and uh, had all my goals set and plans set, and the Lord intervened through a girlfriend that came to faith and began to witness to me, and I didn't know it at the time, but she had all of her friends, her new Christian friends, praying for me by name. I finally went to a Bible study with her, and I, I grew up in a home that didn't teach a lot about what Jews did believe, but clearly what Jews don't believe. And it was made very clear to me from the time that I was knee high, Jews don't believe in Jesus. So that wasn't an option for me. But something happened in that Bible study. I, I, looking back 38 years ago, I felt the presence of God and my separation from him, and I prayed a prayer. Uh, I don't remember the words, but it was a salvation prayer, and went home and tried to forget it because I realized this is not what I want to do with my life. I have other plans, and I'm Jewish besides the fact that um, Jesus isn't for me, and uh, tried to forget it, but something changed that night, 38 years ago, the second Saturday in May of 1980, and I began to, to have a desire to read the Bible. And not just the Bible, Simon, the New Testament, which was a real dilemma because I had never read the New Testament. I was taught the New Testament was a book of a different, about a different religion, had nothing to do with the Jewish people other than being blamed as Jews for killing the God of Christianity. So it was taboo for me, but I, I had this desire that kept growing. I finally found a New Testament, and when I began to read the New Testament, it, it was shocking for me. Right from page, the first page of Matthew, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. That, that was mind-blowing to me. It was shocking to me to discover this God of the Christians actually was a descendant of my Abraham and my David. And as I read on, I discovered that Jesus was Jewish. All of the first disciples were Jews, who Jesus, uh, who had a Hebrew name, Yeshua, sent to the lost sheep of Israel. His ministry on the earth was to his own people. He sent his disciples to his own people, to their own people. And then I discovered all the first followers of Jesus were all Jews who never converted to another religion, and that changed the course of my life. Incredible. And, and how did you cope with that, Justin, in terms of your Jewish friends and the community and your family? I mean, it's, it's a very big step to make. Yeah, it? you know, it was hard. Uh, in the beginning, I was enamored with the person of Jesus, Yeshua, and all the things that I was learning, and the discovery of 
prophecies in my own scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, that reinforced for me that this was the right decision. I stumbled into this through faith, through an encounter, but then I began to uh, uh, bolster that with clear evidence. But when I told my parents, everything changed because they were very, very upset. My mother cried, my father screamed. They sent me to the rabbi who uh, tried to convince me through guilt that this was a terrible decision. He told me my grandfather was rolling over in his grave and that Jews through the centuries have died to prevent this kind of thing. And then sent me a follow-up letter uh, in, which he, in which he called me a Nazi, that just as the Nazis sought to destroy us physically, my faith was destroying our people spiritually. So there was a lot of guilt. We, we Jews are very susceptible to guilt. And uh, I experienced a lot of guilt from my parents, from family, friends. Uh, and I almost lost my faith over it. It was a very, very difficult time, but uh, sought the Lord. There were people praying for me, and I eventually came to a point where I was so convinced that this was true. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Amen to that. And from that time on, I've never looked back. Uh, I committed my life to serve the Lord. 34 years ago in, in full-time ministry, just celebrated 34 years of ministry. And uh, it's been a remarkable journey. So yes, it's, it, there's, there's many Jewish people that I've encountered since then that don't understand and are very angry, uh, but this is true. And uh, I'm seeing the blindness coming off of the eyes of Jewish people. So there's progress. We just keep going and understanding that there's a 2,000 year legacy of hatred in the name of, name of Christ and Christianity that we have to overcome. No, absolutely, and, and it's on that point that anyone who reads the scriptures, both the Old and the New Testament, and to me they're just one and the same book, there is no difference between the two because it's the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is, is still the God in the New Testament. You only have to read the book of Revelation to know that. Um, but really the point I want to make is, um, how has the church for over 2,000 years been so deceived when it comes to the Jewish roots of the faith? The fact that uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, was Jewish, his disciples were Jewish, or the whole entire early church was Jewish. And yet what we've seen over the centuries is any Jewish element completely ripped out right. of our scriptures right. and interpretation. And it's very, very sad that that's happened. And Paul warns the church in Romans chapter 11 before the emergence of, of replacement theology. It had already began very early by the uh, early part of the second century. But Paul warns us, boast not against the natural branches. He's warning the church that if God's finished with them, he's, fin he's why trust that he's not finished with you? Absolutely. So there's this warning. Uh, I think Paul had the foresight to see where things were going. Uh, and it did go in that direction. So by 325, with the Nicene uh, Council, you have all things Jewish removed from the church. I think that it's a combination of a few things, uh, Simon. The growing success of the gospel among the Gentiles, the fact that Ro Rome was persecuting the Jewish people, especially after 70 AD through the Bar Kokhba revolt. But then you have the spiritual reality of, the, of Satan that is committed to the destruction of the Jewish people because he knows the role that the Jewish people uh, play in the redemption of the world. Uh, and what Christians don't understand that Satan understands, I think, is that the Jewish people play as important a role in the return of the Messiah as they played in the first coming of the Messiah. He was ordained to come through the children of Abraham and it's through the children of Abraham that all the nations are blessed, which is the call of the Jewish people and the ultimate fact that Jesus had to come through the Jewish people and that the Jewish people have to recognize and cry out to him before he returns. And so Satan's plan, I think, is very simple. Anti-Semitism, as many scholars say, is not a... Uh, a, an irrational, illogical hatred of the Jewish people. 
Anti-Semitism is a very, very logical, very rational, very calculated effort to stop God's plan from being fulfilled. And it's for me that simple, that this is satanic, demonic at its root, and sadly the church fell into that deception. Uh, and sadly, that disease uh, known as uh, you know, Jew hatred is, is still very much uh, alive and kicking today, uh, particularly in Britain and Europe. Um, I mean, we're looking at the highest levels of anti-Semitism on record since prior to the start of World War II. Uh, the fact also that Her Majesty's opposition is plagued with uh, news stories relating to some kind of anti-Semitic incident happening week in, week, uh, week out, uh, which is causing great alarm amongst the British Jewish community. And even in, for example, in France and in, in Brussels, you have the Jewish community there that are very scared to even be identified as, as being Jewish. But there is something very special about the United States and the history of the United States that ever since um, President uh, Washington um, defeated the British, um, there's been a very close relationship where the Jewish community has almost been accepted um, as equals in the United States. That hadn't happened before in history. Do you think that's why America is so blessed? Absolutely. I think uh, America from its roots has provided religious freedom for the Jewish people. Uh, and the Jewish people played a very important role from the Revolutionary War on. Uh, I do see anti-Semitism growing in the United States, particularly on college campuses. Uh, Anti-Zionism uh, many who uh, are involved in this claim is not anti-Semitism, but I would beg to differ. It is anti-Semitism at its root, and it's growing rampant in the in universities and the left wing in the United States. So I'm very troubled by what I'm seeing in America, but it's clearly worse in Europe right now, and particularly Western Europe, sadly. Uh, Simon and I might be moving across the boundaries of political correctness, but Islam, fundamentalist Islam at its root, is anti-Semitic. And I believe they're the new carriers of anti-Semitism. And it's spreading quickly worldwide. Absolutely. Um, wh why do you think we're, we're seeing such a, a, a global outbreak of, uh, of anti-Semitism? Because after the, after the horrors of World War II and when the revelations came out about what Hitler did, the, the murder of, uh, eight mil uh, of six million Jews on an industrial scale by the Nazis, really meant the whole issue of, of anti-Semitism was pretty much a taboo subject. Um, it had pockets of it, but it was kept down by society. And, and now, almost over 70 years on, uh, we seem that uh, this problem is um, threatening to destroy Western civilization, particularly sure. in Europe. Well, anti-Semitism repeats itself throughout history. You see it from the time of, you see it in the Book of Esther, you see it with uh, Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh that doesn't recognize the blessing of the Jewish people that Joseph and his people have brought. You see it with Herod killing the, all the male firstborn. This has repeated itself. Uh, the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, uh, the pogroms of Eastern Europe. After the Holocaust, there was a period of horror and an effort to, uh, to shift Christian thinking. Unfortunately, there was a liberal movement that, that, that uh, moved in that direction and rejected the validity of the gospel to the Jewish people, which for me as a Jewish believer is troubling. But we're just seeing the rise of it again because it's been a, a blight on humanity. And again, I think it's a satanic. It's a demonic strategy uh, that uh, Satan understands clearly that the Jewish people are key to the redemption of mankind. And he hates God's plan, he hates God's word, and the Jews are the, 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 the focal point of keeping that redemptive plan from taking place. That's how I understand scripture. Absolutely. Uh, and if we talk about uh, your organization, uh, Jewish, Jewish Voice Ministries, um, can you share with us the, the depth and the structures within your organization and the incredible humanitarian work that you're doing through Jewish Voice, as well as having a, a weekly program that uh, our viewers can watch on Revelation Yeah, thank TV. you. So we've been around since 1967. I didn't start 
the ministry, I was seven years old when it started, it <laughs> began with a real pioneer named Lewis Kaplan, who was a Jewish believer, kicked out of his home at 19 years of age, rode the rails in America, and uh, was, had a healing ministry with the Assemblies of God. And then in 1967, right before the Six Day War, just months before the Six Day War, God told him, start a ministry to reach your own people. Jewish voice, and it was a radio ministry. Began in Phoenix, Arizona with one station and then spread from there. I, from the time that I was uh, a, a young believer, knew God was calling me to reach my own people with the gospel. Simon, Romans 1.16 is kind of the foundational scripture for our ministry, for my ministry, which is I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah, for it's the power of God for everyone who believes, but it's to the Jew first and then to the nations. And for me, that began with a congregation, as a congregational leader of a Messianic Jewish congregation in upstate New York, right on the border with Canada. And then uh, four years later, uh, I went through an open door the Lord provided to work in Russia with the Jewish people wide open to the gospel and through festivals of Jewish music and dance, cultural events, I was able to share my faith and watch thousands of Jewish people respond to the gospel, come forward in altar calls. By 1995, we were filling football stadiums. I'm not talking about American football. <laughs> I'm talking about uh, real football. Good, I'm glad you said that. Yes. <laughs> so we, were, we, we would see 60,000 mostly Jewish coming, knowing they were going to hear about Jesus. And uh, just through sharing my testimony and then inviting people to respond, Tens of thousands responded to the gospel. And uh, from that, we moved into uh, lost tribe communities uh, that needed medical care, dental care, eye care, places like Ethiopia and now Zimbabwe. I'm seeing Jewish people come to faith. I'm seeing Romans 11.25 fulfilled before my very eyes where Paul says that a blindness has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and then all Israel will be saved. Simon, it's progressive, I believe. And I've been watching that happen for the last 20, uh, 29 years on the mission field and another uh, period where it was much slower in the United States, but it's happening. Fantastic. So let's have a look at uh, one of your videos. And uh, this is called The History of uh, Jewish Voice. It was just over 50 years ago that traveling evangelist Lewis Kaplan heard a call from the Lord. He was to give up his work holding revival meetings and begin a worldwide ministry on the radio, sharing the good news with the Jewish people about their Messiah Yeshua. During that important year of 1967, the first Jewish Voice Broadcasts radio program was broadcast on KHEP Christian Radio in Phoenix. Four months later, on June 5, 1967, war erupted in Israel. In just six days, the war was over. Israel had won, and pivotal prophecy was fulfilled. The Jewish people controlled Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years. From its inception, the mission of Jewish Voice has been intimately entwined with Israel and the Jewish people. In many ways, the Jewish Voice story is really Israel's story, and ultimately, God's story. The next year, the network grew to 22 stations. And in 1969, Jewish Voice broadcasts expanded to become international. Lewis Kaplan began the decade of the 1970s by traveling to Israel to preach and share his dream of broadcasting there. A woman named Kira was in the audience and became fascinated by his mission. Within a year, Lewis and Kira married and she joined the ministry. One of her first contributions was to begin the Jewish Voice Broadcast newsletter. By 1972, Jewish Voice broadcasts were heard weekly on 43 radio stations. 
That same year, the ministry sent its first witnessing teams to the streets of Israel. In 1974, Elliot Clayman, a Messianic Jewish attorney, taught Jewish voice broadcasts first Bible school classes in Carmel, Haifa in Israel. Jewish Voice Broadcasts celebrated its 10-year anniversary by opening the JVB Center in Phoenix in 1978. The ministry also began production of the first Messianic Jewish satellite television program in the world. The pilot TV program aired that fall on CBN, PTL, and TBN, and it originated in the Kaplan Living Room. The new JVB Center was finished early in 1979. The Phoenix Messianic Fellowship was founded that year and began regularly meeting at the JVB Center. The next year, across the country, in Buffalo, New York, a 20-year-old Jewish college student named Jonathan Burns accepted Yeshua as his Messiah. In 1982, the Phoenix Messianic Fellowship became a congregation in Arizona while two years later, 24-year-old Jonathan Burns founded Congregation Shema Yisrael in his hometown of Rochester, New York. The 24-year-old Messianic rabbi was to serve the congregation for nearly a decade. Meanwhile, in 1985, yours truly became the new host of JVB's television program called L'Chaim. Jewish Voice Broadcasts present L'Chaim, meaning to life, proclaiming the life of the Messiah. In 1990, Rabbi Jonathan Burnus embarked on his first trip to the Soviet Union. He went specifically to visit refuseniks who were Soviet Jews being persecuted for observing Jewish tradition. His destinations were Moscow and St. Petersburg, and he traveled with five representatives from the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. They were armed with 300 Bibles, 400 pieces of Messianic literature, and a list of five refuseniks in six days, everything they brought with them had been distributed. Jonathan was deeply impacted and returned several times to share his faith. It was on an airplane flying home from his third trip that the Lord spoke to him, calling him to return once again to reach my people. There were three million Jewish people in the former Soviet Union at that time, and Rabbi Bernus could only think of two individuals who were trying to reach them with the gospel. The next year, in May of 1993, Jonathan Burnus conducted the first International Festival of Jewish Music and Dance in St. Petersburg, Russia. It was a tremendous success, with more than 14,000 attending and 3,600 Jewish people coming forward in altar calls and filling out follow-up cards. That fall, at the age of 33, Jonathan resigned as Rabbi Shema Yisrael and started Hear O Israel Ministries. He moved to St. Petersburg and founded the Messianic Jewish Center there and more than 300 attending weekly services. Over the next 12 months, festivals were launched in Minsk, Belarus, Kiev, Ukraine, and in Moscow. New Messianic Jewish congregations were formed in all three cities. In fact, the congregation founded in Kiev is now the largest in the world with nearly 2,000 members. The following year, 1995, Hero Israel festivals began to fill football stadiums. Only stand if you want to pray this prayer with yes, me. The next year, Kira Kaplan traveled to Kishnev, Moldova to document the Hero Israel festival. More quietly, she met with Jonathan Burnus to discuss the possibility that he might be Lewis Kaplan's successor upon Kaplan's retirement. Jonathan's reply was a swift, thanks, but I'm not interested. And with that, the third decade of Jewish Voice broadcasts came to a close. Well, that shows you some uh, incredible insight into the work of uh, Jewish Voice over the years. Um, Jonathan, you, you must be very proud to be the president and CEO of such an organisation that is doing uh, incredible work in terms of spreading the gospel and educating the church about its Jewish roots. But I have to ask you now about the um, Messianic Jewish community in Israel because um, they are not only loyal to the state, 
but uh, so many uh, Messianic uh, Jewish believers are serving in the top echelons within uh, the Israeli defense establishment in the IDF and others who are more than patriotic. What do you think it means when you have um, a believer serving in the IDF who fears God and prays? What do you think that adds to Israel's defense capabilities? I think it's a huge benefit because you have alignment not only with the values of the state of Israel and the Jewish people that believe in a restoration of the homeland, but you have people that are totally aligned with God's plan for the Jewish people, which is both the physical restoration back to their land, but also, Simon, their spiritual restoration back to God. And that, we believe, is through a relationship with him that's provided by his Messiah the one name given under heaven by which we must be saved. That's true for Christians and all people, but it's, to, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a way that's made to the, for the Jew first, as I said earlier. And I think that um, Israeli believers are some of the most dedicated, committed soldiers and citizens and really care about the well-being of Israel. You know, I, I've watched Simon, the shift in Israel from the uh, kibbutzim uh, era, established in 1948, and through the 80s, where people were more concerned about uh, the, 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 the value of the whole than the individual. I've seen a shift where it's become very individualistic. And that's why the, the whole uh, kibbutz movement hasn't been successful because it was about the corporate good yes. of the community, whereas now it's about what can I get? That's happened in Israel. But among the believers, there's a commitment to the whole. And there, there's still, of course, the reality that Israel has to survive. And Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. But I see with believers this, this greater commitment to the good of the whole. And that benefits society. Uh, so yeah, and of, and of course, um, there's a lot of love and unity with Palestinians that love the Lord also. It's the only place where there's true peace, where there's true shalom, is, is through the Messiah. It's amazing to see it. It's amazing to be part of. Uh, can, can you share with us a, a little bit about, um, about the way that uh, Yeshua is having a big impact upon the uh, Jewish community, not only in Israel, but also around the world, as, as many are coming to faith in him. And, and especially as we see that the lies that have been said about uh, church replacement theology seem to be sure. breaking down before us. Well, let me start there with replacement theology. The problem with replacement theology is that if God reached a point where he said enough with the Jewish people, how can Christians trust that God has remained faithful to the church? Absolutely. How can I, as an individual, believe that God will continue to forgive me if he reached a point of anger with Israel where he said, God, I'm finished with them, I'll get a new people. Our, God's faithfulness to the church is dependent on God being faithful to the Jewish people. So replacement theology has to be wrong for the benefit of the, of the church. has to be wrong. Now, uh, as, as far as the impact of Jewish believers and Yeshua himself, the Messianic Jewish community is growing significantly. In Israel, it's growing. It's growing in the United States. It's now spread throughout Russia and former Soviet Union and Eastern uh, Europe. It's now, we're now finding lost tribe communities in Africa that are responding to the gospel. This should be encouraging for every Christian because it means God is fulfilling his word that in the last days, he would restore the people of Israel, not just to their land, but back to himself. So this is, this is fundamentally important. I also see Simon, uh, Messianic Jews, really leading the charge to support Israel. So we've really become an important bridge between the evangelical community and support of the state of Israel and the security of Israel. And I think Israel's recognizing 
that evangelical Christians, along with Messianic Jews, although it's less, uh, I think it's less communicated and some try to avoid this, but we're the best friends Israel has. We really are. People like you and this, this ministry, Revelation TV, are some of the best friends Israel has. And I think the Messianic Jewish community has done a great job, perhaps in many cases, off the radar at helping Christians understand that if they love God, if they love the God of Israel and they love the Messiah of Israel, then they have a responsibility to the, to the, 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 the descendants, the true brethren of the Messiah, the Jewish people. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, also, I, th I think what's also very historically significant, isn't it, um, uh, Jonathan, is the fact that we're living in a time that has never existed in the history of the world. Uh, and what I mean by that is that never before has the church and the nation of Israel coincided um, in the same period of time together, which makes it very, very special. So. Um, in light of that, what do you think the role of Christians and the church is towards Israel and the Jewish people? I think Christ the Christians have a number of, of responsibilities. Uh, one is that is an understanding that it's through the Jewish people. Romans 9 talks about this, that the Jewish people provided for Christians all of the things that 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 uh, revealed the true God, uh, the prophets, the, uh, the tabernacle, the law, all of these things up to and including the Messiah who's brought salvation to the nations. So there's a call of, uh, to, to respond back with gratitude and support for the survival of the Jewish people. I think that's incumbent upon every Christian but also Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 11, that their rejection, the rejection of the Jewish people, which is temporary, brought you salvation, you Gentiles, with the responsibility to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. In other words, to demonstrate the love, the peace, the sense of identity that the Jewish people were destined to have as a royal priesthood, as a holy generation, as a people called to bring the revelation of God to the world. That has passed predominantly to the Gentiles who have been grafted in to the natural olive tree as, as wild branches. And so we have to, the church has to provoke the Jewish people to jealousy. Sadly, Simon, there's a 2,000 his, year history of provoking and animosity and even atrocities in the name of Christ and Christianity. And true Christians need to overcome that by showing love to the Jewish people and ultimately provoking them into a relationship with the God of Israel. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and you're doing that as well, aren't you? I mean, can you share with us what uh, you're doing in, uh, in Ethiopia um, and also reaching out to these uh, forgotten Jewish tribes around the world? Well, I, I absolutely love Israel, thanks to my dear friend and board member here in UK, Gerald Gotson, who's actually with us. Uh, fell in love with Ethiopia, from the first visit in 1998 and made a commitment that I've kept to the Beta Israel, the, the House of Israel remaining in Ethiopia. There's about 140,000 Ethiopians living in Israel now, Ethiopian Jews that have been assimilated into Israel. But there's tens of thousands that remain in Ethiopia that are living in abject poverty. And for uh, almost 20 years now, we've been providing free medical care, free medicines, dental care, uh, and some pretty significant dental care. We've saved lives through dental care. Eye care, eyeglasses, and most exciting, eye surgeries. We're using Western technology in remote parts of Ethiopia for cataract surgery, for cornea transplants, all free of charge, and now water purifiers, personal water purifiers and family purifiers to raise the quality of life because these people are waiting and hungering to go to Israel. We want to keep them alive until they can realize their dream and also help them find a relationship with them, their Messiah. Fantastic. So let's have a look now at uh, the uh, second part of the uh, history of uh, Jewish Voice and then we'll have a look at some of the miracles being carried out in Ethiopia. 
Decade four began with formation of the Messianic Jewish Bible Institute to train leaders for the Jewish harvest in partnership with God's Grace and Tikkun International and Shady Grove Church in Dallas. Dr. Wayne Wilkes and his wife Bonnie served faithfully as the first international director for 20 years. In August of 1997, the Kaplans were in Finland en route to meet Jonathan Burness to participate in a Hero Israel Ministries Festival when Louis Kaplan suffered a devastating stroke. He spent three weeks in a hospital in Finland. In May of 1998, Israel turned 50 years old, and the next month, Jonathan was again asked to lead Jewish Voice broadcast, this time with a better reception. He eventually agreed and was elected the executive director of Jewish Voice broadcasts. A year later, May 19, 1999, Louis Kaplan went to be with the Lord. In October, Hero Israel Ministries broke ground with a new kind of event held in Gondor, Ethiopia. It was still called a festival, but it included a medical team of four doctors who would minister to the great physical needs of the people in attendance. This event planted the seed for the massive medical outreaches that would follow in the new millennium. In 2003, Kira Kaplan and several other board members attended a very important event as Jonathan Burness married Elise Angela Carneo in Cariba, Brazil. A year later, on January 30th, 2004, Kira Kaplan passed away. The next March, Jonathan spent most of the month in Ethiopia accompanied by 70 healthcare professionals for a concentrated medical outreach to the Beta Abraham and Beta Israel Jewish communities in Addis Ababa and Gondar. They served 7,512 patients, distributed 3,400 pairs of eyeglasses, and two specialist surgeons performed 50 eye surgeries. Also in March of 2006, JVMI opened and registered Jewish Voice Ministries Canada with the assistance of Rabbi Jeff Foreman, leader of City of David Congregation in Toronto. Jewish Voice United Kingdom followed two years later with the opening of an office in London led by Jonathan's longtime friend, Dr. Ruth Fleischer. The 40th anniversary of Jewish Voice found the ministry growing even faster Important initiatives for the fifth decade included the new media center, medical outreach clinics, leadership training initiatives, including the Messianic Jewish Roundtable. The ministry also began working to assist hundreds of Jewish believers in Israel who are in need through the partner ministries there. In 2011, Chosen Books released Jonathan's first full-length book, A Rabbi Looks at Jesus of Nazareth. Each year of the decade brought important new events. In 2012, the first outreach to the Limba took place in Beringa, Zimbabwe. Also that year, Jonathan announced that a television special, The Miracle of Israel, would soon launch in six to eight major cities with significant Jewish populations. There have been numerous medical outreaches each year, and as of 2017, as JVMI celebrates its 50th year, 86 Messianic congregations have been planted in Zimbabwe, with 18 planted in Ethiopia. Many important milestones have been achieved this year. Among them, Jewish Voice treated its 400,000th medical outreach patient, welcomed its 1 millionth outreach participant, and perhaps most notably, the ministry opened its first office in Israel. Just as the beginnings of Jewish Voice were inextricably tied to the historic and prophetic event of the land of Israel reclaiming Jerusalem, standing with Israel and introducing the Jewish people to their Messiah Yeshua continues to be the center of this ministry. God has been good during these incredible first 50 years. And we look forward to what God has planned for the future until Yeshua returns.
There you go, what a history uh, of uh, Jewish voice over the years. Um, Jonathan, I, I have to tell you, I have to ask you about what's happening in the United States with uh, President Trump. Um, I mean, we're living in such extraordinary times. Who would have thought, and I certainly wouldn't have thought, that uh, President Trump, A, would have got elected, and uh, secondly, um, actually to move the US Embassy from uh, Tel Aviv to Jerusalem and recognize Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem uh, to mark Israel's 70th anniversary as a nation reborn. Um, can you tell us what is happening uh, in the States uh, and why is this administration blessing Israel so much and standing with Israel? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand it myself. I was a real doubter. I was not a, a Trump supporter because I didn't believe there was a, a commitment to the evangelical community. And the evangelical community played a major role in the President, President Trump being elected. Uh, and I also believe it's, it's a divine thing now. I, I just didn't see it before. And when he became president, I was shocked, as were most evangelical friends in the Messianic Jewish community. And then very doubtful that he would fulfill his promises, but it's been an amazing thing to see. And then when he declared uh, Jerusalem as the capital and stated that he would move the embassy, I thought it would take a number of years because I know there's been a lot of pushback. We're very polarized in America over this presidency and over the decisions that are being made, but he's kept his word to the evangelical community. He's been keeping his word to the Jewish community, and it's been an astounding thing. I believe that he is aligning America with the blessings of God, maybe unknowingly. I don't know. I know a lot of people around him uh, that speak into his life, and he listens to them, according to my friends that have access to him, and he's made some great decisions that he's kept. I believe America uh, has now aligned with God's plan for Jerusalem, and Genesis 12, I'll bless those that bless my people. I, I think he's being used by God to align America with his blessings. Um, and there's been many. I, I don't know what the future holds, but I'm very, very pleased with what I've seen so far. And I was there for the embassy opening, and it was an incredible experience indeed. So very exciting times. Again, this has polarized America, and we're, but we're experiencing economic blessing right now as well, and we'll see what happens. Absolutely. But also, uh, you know, we have to mention the fact he's vice president. Uh, you know, Mike Pence is not only a strong uh, and committed Christian, but he demonstrates his love for Israel and the Jewish people. Absolutely. And, uh, Nikki Haley in the UN, um, <laughs> and I've never seen a, uh, an ambassador to the UN um, act on Israel's behalf in such a passionate and, and courageous way that she loves Israel, she loves the Jewish people. And it's almost as if um, the Trump administration's main role is to stand with Israel and to protect Israel as their number one foreign policy, more so than looking after America's national security interests. He's been probably the best president for Israel since Truman, uh, <laughs> recognizing the state of Israel. It's remarkable. Uh, I see a lot of gratitude in Israel towards President Trump. You're, I agree with you completely uh, about Vice President Pence, a very, very solid, committed Christian who loves Israel. And Nikki is our hero. We, my wife wants her to be the next president. I, I'm in agreement with her. She's just amazing. It's a remarkable time we live in now. Uh, in, in terms of uh, politics, because sadly our, our, our own government here in Britain that is supportive of Israel, uh, but unfortunately politics plays a role. And uh, so our, our government talks about um, how it's not in Britain's interest and it's against the two-state solution to recognise Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem. Um, but, but surely the uh, British government could actually move their embassy from Herzliya, where it is now, to, uh, to Jerusalem, even if it's in West Jerusalem, like many other nations are doing, like uh, Guatemala, Paraguay, uh, even talk of Romania uh, and other European nations as well. Honduras. What will it mean for a nation, though, um, in terms of like the United States that stands with Israel? What, what is the blessing that comes with it um, in terms of its spiritual blessing and its economic blessing uh, and general well-being? That's a good question. Again, I go back to Genesis 12. That the Lord decreed that he would bless those that bless Israel 
and that's just as true today as it was when it was written centuries ago. So uh, I think that recognizing the capital that was established by God himself for Israel 3,000 years ago uh, is aligning with the blessing of Genesis 12. I, I don't, people ask me, how does this fulfill Bible prophecy? I'm not sure I see that, but I see alignment with God's plans and purposes for Israel as, as being really important. Uh, you know, I, I, I agree with something that Vice President Pence said in Jerusalem, that any true peace has to be built on truth. And Israel's a sovereign nation that has the right to declare Jerusalem as her capital. And it's bizarre that nations don't align with that uh, because they've afforded that sovereignty to every other nation but Israel. So it, it's a bizarre thing, again, demonic, uh, just to give you the bottom line. Uh, but I agree with President Pen uh, Vice President Pence that uh, peace has to be built on truth and recognizing Jerusalem uh, as the, three th at, at the capital of Israel for 3,000 years is a, a step of truth that I think builds a proper foundation for peace. Absolutely. And also what's, what's remarkable uh, um, about Israel is the, uh, the fact that the land is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy from the prophets from thousands of years ago has come alive in our day. Everlasting our, possession. And we have the opportunity to actually see God's word come alive in our day. So you're almost uh, like we're living in, in, in biblical times. In light of that, how should um, believers in Yeshua HaMashiach stand in these days? And what should their reaction be towards God's people, the Jewish people in Israel? Well, Simon, thank you for asking that. First of all, I, I, no Messianic Jew that I know or solid evangelical leader supports every action of Israel. They are a society predominantly in unbelief that need the gospel, that need uh, a revelation of God's law and order, that's absolutely true. And we're, we believe that that's the greatest thing that Israel can experience is a revival of the good news and a revelation of who the true Messiah is. I think regard, that, that Christians are called to stand with the Jewish people uh, regardless of their response to the gospel. And again, that doesn't, that doesn't sanction everything Israel does, but their right to the land as an as a, a, a irrevocable promise and their calling as a people, again, is irrevocable. And Christians should understand that. So yes, they're in unbelief, and I don't believe they'll experience true peace and unbelief, but their right to the land is indisputable. It's a biblical land grant promised by God to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I think Christians either align with, with that because it's, it's part of the word of God or the Bible becomes origami. It's just cut and paste as you choose. And then why do we even believe in a literal uh, uh, death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah. It's dangerous. We either take the whole word of God or none of it. Absolutely. We can't pick and choose. Absolutely. Uh, and I've been studying uh, recently, and it's been coming, I've uh, been shared on my heart, really, the whole prophecy in Ezekiel 37 about the dry bones and the different stages. Uh, first, um, Ezekiel is told to prophesy these dead bones, and then the bones come alive. Um, and then the Lord talks about then um, proclaiming to, Je uh, to uh, Ezekiel to proclaim um, a mighty army. And we see a mighty army. And then it talks about the son of uh, David taking the throne and setting up his right. kingdom. So do you think that we are that close to the millennial reign of Yeshua HaMashiach that we now see in Israel probably the most powerful army in the world, certainly the most powerful army in the Middle East? I do, I do indeed. I believe we're in the end of the end. I think the restoration of Israel in 1948 set a prophetic time clock uh, ticking again. 1967 was a direct fulfillment of the words of Yeshua himself that Jerusalem would be trodden down by the Gentiles until a set period in to of time known as the fulfillment of the time of the Gentiles that happened in 1967. And uh, I don't know if many Christians are aware that shortly after that there was a revival 
in the nations, particularly in America with the Jesus movement, the uh, uh, charismatic renewal, and many, many Jewish people came to faith in Yeshua, retained their identity, and that's really the birth of the modern Messianic Jewish movement, directly connected to the restoration of Jerusalem. And I think we're getting closer and closer and closer to the return of the Messiah. And I believe he's coming back literally, physically, bodily, not to Rome or London or New York. He's coming back to Jerusalem. And uh, that had to be back under the control of the Jewish people so they could cry out, blessed is you comes in the name of the Lord, because Jesus said, you won't see me again until you say that. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. I can hear the words <laughs> coming Amen. out of Jerusalem. And in the final few minutes of the program, um, Rabbi Jonathan, um, how can our viewers really prepare themselves for the coming apostasy? Because uh, Yeshua talks about the end of the age is marked with a huge increase in apostasy. Yeah, I don't think that there's any way to prepare physically for it, like storing food or water. I'm just not a believer in that. I believe in spiritual preparation. That's going to get us through as long as we're here, and I don't, I don't know how long. Mm. Pre, mid, post, I, I don't know. We endure until he comes, until we're taken out. And the only way we can do that is by growing closer to the Lord now while there's this period of grace where we, can, where we need to cultivate the ear of our spirit to hear the voice of God, see through his eyes, and be close enough to him that when disaster strikes, we're prepared spiritually because we have cultivated our relationship with God and we can be led by him in that kind of detail. I believe the world's getting darker and darker. That, that's just the reality and it's going to get darker and darker. But we who are committed to serving the Lord are going to get brighter and brighter and brighter. And I think, Simon, that the opportunities ahead for God's people is greater than any time in, in his, the history of the world. So I'm glad I live now in these days. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan uh, Bernus, I just want to thank you so much for being uh, my special guest uh, on the Middle East Report and uh, thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, thank you for your remarkable program, uh, Jewish Voice, and the work that you do around the world. And, you know, uh, in terms of Israel and the Jewish people and also the Messianic community, it's uh, just a pleasure to serve them and fight for them. Honestly, thank you, and I'm so, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to be with you and all you're doing. Thank you. And uh, I just want to thank you for watching this very special edition of the Middle East Report. And uh, as uh, Rabbi Jonathan Bernice has said, it's so important that we stand with Israel, that we stand with what the scriptures say about the importance of Israel and the Jewish people, especially in these last days. So thank you for watching this special edition of the Middle East Report. Shalom.